I do want to start with Exxon's bid to acquire Hess's Guyana stake, of course, exploring that one. Do you see that ultimately being successful if pursued? Uh, I don't know whether or not it'll be successful, but it certainly has the prospect of derailing the transaction. It's not surprising necessarily that they're trying to exercise their right of first refusal, but it is somewhat surprising as a former M&A lawyer that this really wasn't addressed up front before the deal was inked, because this, this deal is pretty far down the road, and so Exxon coming in and preemptively exercising their right of first refusal um, should have been something that was foreseen by the lawyers and also the executives at Chevron. Yeah, and uh, of course, Chevron is adamant that this won't happen, that uh, of course, that bid ultimately won't go through. We'll see how that one develops. But zooming out, there has been so much M&A in this sector so far, just in the past couple of months. Of course, you have Exxon and Pioneer, you have Chevron and Hess, and you also have a very aggressive FTC, uh, really taking shots across industries right now. When it comes to Exxon's proposed acquisition of Pioneer, how confident are you that that will actually go through? I think there's some real questions given the basin concentration in the Permian and how active the FTC has been really across industries. Another one to keep an eye on is the acquisition or the merger of equals between Chesapeake and Southwestern, which will give uh, Chesapeake a bigger position both in the Haynesville and the Marcellus. If you really look at the dynamics there, it's 7% on a combined basis of U.S. production, so in the grand scheme of things, not huge. But like Exxon in its dominant position, or uh, soon to be dominant position in the Permian, you have two other basins where you'd have a dominant player with a very aggressive FTC um, uh, reviewing it. Well, Hank, when I speak to investors and analysts about this industry, energy in general, they say that, I mean, this is a sector that's ripe for consolidation. It's ripe for more of these tie-ups, these mergers of equals. But do you think that the FTC's stance will keep some of these potential deals on the sideline? Uh, I think it really depends on how aggressive they are with these two um, acquisitions, because if the FTC comes in and really attacks these two acquisitions as it has in a couple of other industries, you may have a wait and see attitude on the part of the industry uh, through the November elections to see if there's a change in administration and a more constructive FTC as it relates to M&A activity. But I think before you see that, I think you really need to um, see how these two, the, the Exxon Pioneer and also the uh, Chesapeake and Southwestern transactions play out. Well, I want to talk a bit about EOG, since that is one of the names uh, that you feel pretty positive on at the moment. EOG, it's interesting because it's been able to avoid M&A, unlike a lot of uh, what's going on in shale right now. Do you think that it will eventually have to participate, or do you think that it can continue to avoid any M&A? You know, I think there's a magical number at about $50 billion as far as a market cap where you have enough scale to be relevant in your basins. And so the interesting thing about EOG is it's a multi-basin player. It's not concentrated in a single basin. They have some decent offshore production, natural gas in Trinidad. And I think it's kind of a mini Exxon. They, they've been efficient. They've been focused on efficiency for a good long while. And so if you kind of are at that $50 billion number, you have enough scale to be relevant, and these are becoming manufacturing businesses. They're just manufacturing right now. But you also become an attractive target to be taken out by a major. So I don't think they really have to be as active on the M&A front. They may do so, but I don't think they have to be active to be relevant going forward. I do want to zoom out because you sent over some really thoughtful notes to our producers. You talk about this death of exploration and production, really describing this environment where the oil majors, they're pulling back when it comes to frontier exploration. You posit that that's good news for investors. We're gonna to get to that in just a bit, but I wanna start with, why do you think that's happening at all? Well, if you look at the shift in energy, so you have this great shift to renewables. And so this, this creates a specter over the in industry where they don't have the real long-term focus like they've had in the past. Investors want cash returned immediately, which means an exploitation of their existing portfolio 
and then acquisitions that enhance their inventory within their existing portfolio. And these companies are being transformed effectively into manufacturing businesses. So the North Slope and all these great uh, exploratory discoveries in the past, I don't think you'll see as many of those because I don't think investors will have the patience given the headwinds against the industry in the future. So it sounds like uh, an investor such as yourself, that's a dynamic that you're welcoming at this point. Absolutely, because as you take more and more private companies, which have been incredibly active, um, you take those out of the market. I think that's supportive of energy prices and it's supportive of the thesis of this is really a manufacturing business. You want scale, you want efficiencies, you want to eliminate G&A to really be a low cost producer. And so that's the dynamic you're seeing. I think that's great long term for investors and I think that's good for commodity prices as well. And I don't have a lot of time left with you. Obviously, you invest across assets, but also in energy as well. And when it comes to names such as Exxon, such as Chevron, of course, they're trading at pretty big discounts to the overall S&P 500. And you walk through some of these dynamics and the fact that, you know, we're at record production for several of them. They're buying back shares as well. Why yeah. aren't these companies seeing a broader embrace? Well, I think that markets ebb and flow. So, I mean, energy's really had... Um, several periods of time over the past decade where you've seen big declines in commodity prices. So the generalists have been burned by energy. But as you see this consolidation of the industry, you know, if, if the Chesapeake transaction goes through, it'll become an S&P traded company or an S&P 500 company. I think energy will become much more investable for the generalist investor.